Welcome to Amusement Sparks. Uh, my name is Andrew Spawn. I'm the host of this here show, and uh, we're going to design another theme park together. For this special episode, I've got a returning guest from Season 1, Nathan K. Hey, guys. And uh, why do I have you on the show? Why do I like I, you? I asked myself that. I was asking myself that while I was setting up, actually. Well, I mean, you contacted me because you were listening to my Pokemon podcast, which is extremely flattering to me. And uh, I love podcasting, so I'm absolutely excited for the opportunity to come on. I love Amusement Sparks, and uh, this is awesome. I'm excited. Well, thanks. I'm excited, too. Yeah, uh, Sylph Radio is amazing, and it's one of my favorite things that is Pokemon-related in the whole world. Like, I like your show more <laughs> than the games, to be honest. Oh, my God. That is the nicest thing anybody has <laughs> ever yeah. said to me. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. I really appreciate that. I mean, sure. I it's my love and my passion, and yeah. uh, that means the world to me. And, and your other two shows, Fair Enough and Fair Point, are both really awesome as well, and they get into a very huge variety of topics, but you bring the same charisma and the same attitude and the same, like, uh, dignity to every single topic, and I really value that. And it's I, amazing that you throw the word dignity in there, I was going to say, maybe thanks. dignity was a little bit too respectful of a word for what you oh, people thanks. do, but... Um, <laughs> no, I do think that you bring a, um, a certain gravitas, a certain level of respect to whatever topic you're talking about. It's, it's pretty cool. We're irreverent, but I think irreverence can be excused if your intent is clear, maybe. I don't know, yeah. and I'm not trying to that's talk good... myself up. But that's what all my heroes in writing and comedy do, and that's what I would aspire to, I guess. Yeah, that's that's a good way of saying it, of what you guys do. So the reason why we are here is to discuss Nickelodeon cartoons and make a theme park based on them. But before we do that, we're going to have to make a pit stop at the Toynado. This um, I'm excited for. Yeah, this is your first opportunity to do this. Um, and so let's see here. I'm going to randomly generate a number that will give us which one of these random... I'm describing this poorly, but it'll be a random pairing of toy-related adjectives and a toy type. So let's see here. The very first one coming up here is a stackable doll. Why would you stack dolls on top of each other? Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, first of all, Disney's already doing it. And, oh, really? uh, oh, yeah. Actually... They kind of do it. The the Tsum Tsums. Yeah, I love those. Let's come up with our own, though. What about, like, I mean, in Native American cultures, they would build these totem poles. I like the idea of, of totem poles and being able to personalize your own. Um, yeah. This is going to seem like a stretch, but are you familiar with Pandora bracelets? Yeah, like the charm bracelets? Yeah. So my my wife, oh my gosh, that's my first time saying that on the podcast. My wife, Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much. She is into those. And like, that's something that her family always gets each other as gifts, like an additional charm. And when I first heard about that, I'm like, I need this of like <laughs> pop culture things that I really, really love. Um, you know, I want to get like little Pokemon charms and like Power Rangers and like all the different franchises I'm into. I would, I would so pay like so much money to get that. And my, my vision for this was like, let's make this appeal to like, you know, uh, preteen and under boys because usually those are the kind of toys i end up buying is like in the the boy department at uh you know toys or us or whatever is like that's that's the kind of stuff i'm into um but i was like what if it could like light up and like make sound effects based on whatever charms are on it and i like got super into it and i'm like i'm gonna make these this is gonna be amazing but it's a little bit ridiculous of an idea i think but anyway um i am super <laughs> into the idea of like totems and being able to customize it and, and express yourself through basically you know stacking things together and building your own totem and it could be totem. almost like a, a pokemon type thing because mm -hmm. there'd be different animals and these animals could have like characteristics and maybe like you're saying uh personalize it maybe that could be the heart of it and maybe the animals could represent different parts of your personality so you'd want to put together like a totem of this represents me like you I know think that's so cool and kind of you can get almost like uh, academic with it like thinking about how every human has certain components in common and, you know, if you if you list the values that are most important to you, some of those values will match up with even your worst enemy. You know what I mean? There's still things you have in common. There's still one part of your totem that is similar. It's like, wow, yeah. we do have some similarities, even though, you know, the, the net result is way different. Some of the ingredients are the same. You know, we both value family a huge amount, even though they're a jerk or whatever. You know, you can kind of... Absolutely. If you you're a child use... and you see that someone else has two of the same totems yeah. in totem as you do mm -hmm. this one represents my creativity this one represents my short temper and it's like instead of wearing your heart on your sleeve it's like wearing your influences and your your passions on your sleeve i think that's kind of cool i don't know exactly how this would manifest itself you know if these are if these are toys if they're dolls 
I guess it could be like a, a TV show too, like a kind of Pokemon kind of thing where you're you're battling your totems or whatever. I don't know. Absolutely. But, Instead of going into Pokeballs, they just turn into like the piece of the statue, but then they can animate and come to life. And oh man, I'm I'm really into kind of kind of Native American lore. And there's like a uh, a project oh, I've been working on in my own uh, spare time that's like uh, Native American Power Rangers, basically. But oh my god, <laughs> doing Native American Pokemon would be really cool as well. Well, I mean, if you listen, as you, you do, I don't know if your listeners do, but if you listen to the podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Jeremy, who's one of our frequent uh, guest hosts, that's me and him. That was almost like the genesis of our friendship was our shared. It was a lot of things, uh-huh. but one of the aspects was our shared interest and passion for like Native American culture and everything. He, I'm, I'm sh- Every white person tries to claim they've got a little <laughs> Native American somewhere down their line. Supposedly there's some Cherokee in my family, but I don't like try to claim that. I'm mm-hmm. I'm just another white kid. But uh, <laughs> Jeremy actually has has it in his culture and his upbringing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for me, it was just a passion that's actually really woven into like my personal and spiritual journey. So like I would love to see something like that happen. Yeah, wow. And I think that your insight of making this instead of just a stackable doll which is a dumb thing but like even just like calling it a totem is like (gasps) that like makes it all click and make sense to me it's like i totally get this and i can totally relate to it now so a plus that was amazing you know there might be some complications because with this recent fad of people saying like oh tina's my spirit animal you know a lot of like native american leaders are like hey this is real serious religious stuff and you know a lot of people could sort of uh take it to be cheapening or ridiculing mm-hmm. something but I, I don't know for me it would be coming from a place of love it, it is a little sketchy to kind of commercialize a you know religious like spiritual item i think that is a little bit hinky but maybe doing this as like a, a more personal thing basically assembling your own totem could still be a kind of spiritual thing you know the reflection yeah. upon yourself but if you're just buying like disney characters to put onto your totem like that's like eh. But I mean, that's pretty much what Pokemon is, anyway. Is these yeah. yokai from Japan? You right. know, it's just if you got some some Native American creators to like, you know, come up with the different characters and stuff, that could be pretty great. Absolutely, I love it. Awesome, yeah, me too. Well, let's uh, let's do another one. Let me get another random number here. All right, we've got an educational watch. If you had a watch that just popped up, like here's a fact about how time works, or Here's how One they... thing I think is fascinating is uh, the minute and second. Uh, the reason that we call minutes minutes and seconds seconds is because there was an hour hand on the clock, and then the clock was divided into all these smaller increments within the hour. Uh-huh. And for those, they created two smaller hands. One of them was called the minute hand because it was a smaller hand. Whoa. And the other one, they didn't know what to call it, so they called it the second hand. No way. Is that true? Absolutely. That's 100% what? true. So. Oh They're called gosh. minutes by new and seconds for literally the second hand on the clock, even though it was the third. But that's yeah. hilarious. It's the second small hand. That that's great. Um. So yeah, even if we just have a watch that, you know, every time you look at it, it pops up another random fact about time. It doesn't have to be time related either. I guess it could just be here's your uh, random trivia fact of this hour. You know, they could have it regimented so there's like twelve of them you can get per day. Every time you look at your watch, it cycles through them. That could be yeah. somewhat educational, and it kind of, it's like one of those calendars, like a desktop ta- calendar. It's like, here's so, your quote of the day, or whatever. So um, it's like the Snapple Watch. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. I'll be here all night. Watch. That was really good. Can I show you guys hiring anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that sells it right there, the Snapple Watch. That's amazing. Well done. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I might have mentioned this on the show before. I'm not exactly sure, but there's a uh, a podcast called Nickelodeon Animation Podcast where they, yes! bring, they yeah, it's such a good show. They bring in the creators of you know various Nickelodeon properties and just kind of interview them and like tell their basically their creative life story and then how they got the show made and it's it's a really cool insight into like creating something and getting it to actually happen and then also getting it picked up by a network I've listened to every single episode so far and it's it's been a really cool insight and I do think that some of the uh, contributions I have during this conversation will probably come from the content I learned from that podcast so just beware so let's start with just Nickelodeon in general. How do we transcribe that into a theme park? What does it mean? And what are we trying to convey with the park? I was born of the generation that gets accused of being raised by the television. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm proud that I was raised 
pretty much by like Jim Henson and his hippie friends and all the <laughs> punk rock kids that made Nickelodeon. Really, seriously, like I really think that instilled values in me that defined who I am and my outlook on the world. Like not defined it, but you know, really I think helped guide me in a great direction of both loving, caring, respecting my neighbors, understanding like differences between people, stuff like that. And then also not just listening to authority and like having an individual identity and, uh, you know, like being true to yourself and rebellious and all that. Like it, I love Nickelodeon. And uh, for me, it's just uh, it was the, my first experience with branding, with a really loving and appreciating a brand. Whatever they put out, I would give it a shot. I think that's so cool, and I, I do think that the punk, like, rebellious attitude is maybe not something that you think of when you first picture Nickelodeon, but that's totally, like, their aesthetic is, like, these creators are going to be themselves and make something that they love, but also happens to be kid-friendly and has a positive message. I think that's a really cool way of doing it, instead of designing things with a specific intent of like this will be kids you know merchandising here's what all the toys are going to look like it's it's more pure than that it's more of a like pure artistic vision i think absolutely i, I really value that about about nickelodeon and their kind of their whole company really is that's what it was founded on so it was originally pinwheel it was a canadian channel it was called pinwheel and then it changed to nickelodeon yeah it, it grew into what we all know and love and then it and then it withered away but <laughs> we won't talk about that yeah once you achieve a certain level of success it's hard to like not sell out especially because you're not wholly creator controlled you know what i mean like the creators mm -hmm. of each show is they're important they're valued but it's not like they're the ones making all the decisions for the network and if they were who knows it might have you know tanked in the at the end of the 90s or something if if there was not enough like uh corporate control on things so yeah you never know not just cartoons <laughs> for doing a theme park based on this collection of shows do you think it should be kind of like a, a hub with a bunch of different spokes going into like each show's different world? Like they can all be separated out or what do you think? That's one of the main appeals to me would be to see the different worlds and, and everything. Maybe not like as their own separate sections of the park because maybe certain ones like, hey Arnold, we only really need a block of his street, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Doug Bluffington, we only really need, you know, a block or two of Bluffington, the school, the you know, whatever, the, maybe the little milkshake place they went to. That would be really cool to see a lot of the, the different worlds, you know, the, the, especially in the cartoons, you know, and to walk down the street of these worlds. Absolutely. But uh, I, I mean, like I said, it was my first experience with branding. You know, obviously I knew Disney, but like I, I'm envisioning Disney World, but Nickelodeon. And I think one of the most magical parts about a, a doing a theme park that's kind of a combination of different franchises is that kind of cross pollination that you get. There's some interesting interplay that you can see, almost like a crossover between two different shows when you have the like transitions between the two different parts. Um, that's something you don't see very often in television is like one character crossing over into the world of another character. But that's something that we can kind of do here and kind of be creative with. I think that'd be really fun if if there's a character that like makes sense to appear in a different part of the park than their own show. I think we should do that and kind of mix it up and be a little bit rebellious with it. In the center of the park, there could be like this, the great Nickelodeon carousel with Reptar and Porkchop and Spike. That'd be really cool. Just, just a big like mosaic of all these different characters and all these different influences building, building something better than each of the parts. <laughs> Let's talk about Doug. This is kind of like an updated uh, Charlie Brown type of show. Doug is just this nice, even-tempered boy in this this world of all these different colored characters. It's kind of interesting. Like every person has their own like color scheme. Their skin tones are all over the place. But it seems to be just kind of a slice of life kind of show. It was sort of the glass of milk of the Nicktoons, if you will. <laughs> um, but. It, it is a great show. And yeah, Jim Davis, the creator, I mean, he wanted it to just be like a nice story about like a good kid and like just, you know, general things about growing up and not about like all this like crazy stuff happening and just yeah. simple. Quail Man was Doug's alter ego. Oh. And uh, you might be able to do something with Quail Man, you know, have him running around the park. That's... Absolutely. <laughs> there has to be a Quail Man running around the park. For I think sure. that'd be fun. Just he, he's got such like a funny look. It's like, you know, what if you had five minutes to make a superhero costume? It's like, well, I have a belt and uh, an extra pair of underwear and, like, a cape. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I don't know that Doug has that many, like, super iconic 
locations or things that you like absolutely have to put in the park and you know hopefully the listener has some additional ideas we could add into this this episode in the future but yeah i don't know i i'm not getting that many like super necessary things i know that um skeeter was a skateboarder so maybe we could do some kind of skateboarding attraction i don't know yeah have him and the rocket power kids at the skate park you right know? and that's that's the kind of thing you can kind of blend those worlds together in a way like it would make sense if uh you know skeeter like grows up and moves to whatever the rocket power town is called <laughs> and like you know hangs out with those guys when they're in college or whatever i think that could yeah, make sense it could even be as simple as just like the safety video you have to watch before you go in there is like hosted by skeeter or yeah. you know oh, and the rocket power kids or whatever awesome let's see here let's talk about rugrats talking about Rugrats okay <laughs> this is a really right. cool show I, I love this show I love the art style I love the music Rugrats is arguably the best show on Nickelodeon but I would contend that uh the adventures of Pete and Pete actually <laughs> holds that distinction and Rugrats is a very close second but historically Rugrats will be remembered not the adventures of Pete and Pete so Rugrats is going to be the Beatles of Nickelodeon but I, I'm totally with you on that <laughs> who's your favorite Who's my favorite Rugrat of the... Hmm, that's a great question. I Probably Tommy, the, who's the main character. I know that's like the stereotypical answer, but he's he's just got a great attitude. He's got a good head on he his is, shoulders. He's, great, he's one of the great uh, protagonists of our time. He really is. <laughs> Chucky's my favorite. I also love Phil and Lil. They're all awesome. They're, they're very close uh, as far as which ones I prefer. Not Angelica. But <laughs> I also really love stew pickles. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Me and my girlfriend are thinking about doing uh, Dee Dee and Stew as a couple's costume this oh, year. Oh, that's awesome. Please yeah. do that. <laughs> that's really it, fun. It might be kind of hard to pull off. We might have to push it to next year, but we're going to try. I mean, <laughs> the hair for, for both her. Of them. Yeah, the, yeah, for both of them, really. <laughs> Stu's hair is so weird. It's it's that kind of like punk aesthetic that that, you know, the whole Nickelodeon thing. It's like. The art styles are very wild on these shows. It's it's well, all over the Rugrats place. Well, Rugrats was designed by the same person that did uh, Aeon Flux. Do you remember Aeon Flux on MTV? Yeah. The like huh. fourth morning, really weird assassin Yeah, they, they made a movie of that too, I think. Yeah, not that huh. great. Yeah, I don't really. I think I only saw the movie. I don't really remember the show. I know that it was on TV. Hmm. They're really cool. They're just uh, kind of shorts that don't really, like, she dies in every single one of them, so they don't have any, like, <laughs> ongoing plot. There's That's barely weird. any dialogue. Huh. But you can look up the Rugrats pilot on YouTube, and the animation is very distinctly different. Like, if you remember this commercial they used to play all the time where Tommy, where Grandpa fell asleep watching fishing, and Tommy and Spike change the channel to Nickelodeon, and they start, like, dancing to it. Yeah. And... It always stuck out because Tommy's wearing an orange T-shirt, and he doesn't wear an orange T-shirt. He wears a blue T-shirt. <laughs> uh, that was in the pilot, and you can actually find that on YouTube, and it's really jarring how different the animation is, and it's very punk rock. I we do love seeing the the pilots of, of cartoons, like when they had a slightly different art style and the audio design wasn't as, as fleshed out, and it is more punk. It's much more like the demo version of a band's yeah. album. You know what I mean? It's kind of cool. Um, and just the music in Rugrats is some of my favorite music ever. Mark Mothersbaugh, Ugh. like the frontman of uh, Devo, and he did the music for like a lot of Wes Anderson films. Like, I just love that guy. The the music, <laughs> the opening theme for Rugrats is like one of the easiest songs to learn on piano. It's just it's so iconic, and it's kind of almost you know how like punk music is usually very very straightforward to play. Like it's usually just like power chords, and it's it's very simple music but it kind of ties into like children's music in a way where it's also very simple, very easy to understand. There's like a, a, a common thread, I think between like Rugrats, like music for babies, but it's also got a kind of like punk influence in like a, um, there's, there's more to it than just like a lullaby kind of thing. Yeah. There's actually a whole chapter. If you read this book called slimed a oral history of Nickelodeon, I believe. And there's a whole chapter in it about the music and the different people that had to make these decisions and what type of music they're going to use in the commercials and for the shows. And it is it, a, a great, great read. That's really cool. But, and they, they had really good um, direction as far as like the early days of Nickelodeon having um, Fred Seibert there, the guy who like created Frederator Studios that does um, all of the like Pendleton Ward shows and stuff they okay. created adventure time he was their like creative director or something from like 
the mid eighties to like the mid nineties and like really helped to kind of shape the identity of Nickelodeon. And it, it's, that guy's had a huge impact on modern uh, television. But anyway, I think that they had really good leadership that really understood like what the creators were capable of and like held them to that. And I think that's, that's the way to do it. If you're going to have like a, you know, a, a, I don't even know how to really describe it, but like a combination of several different creators working together on the same network, you have to have kind of, a good system in place for getting those creators to achieve their visions. Okay. So coming into this podcast, I had two really big ideas that I'm really excited about that I would really love to see. And one of them is literally a really big idea and (laughs) the Rugrats idea. And I think this would be the attraction that brings people to the park. This would be the, like the central attraction of the park. Cool. Let's hear it. And it's fitting because it's Rugrats. Okay. The, the, The pickles household. Yeah. But on such a gigantic scale, oh, so man. as to make you feel like you are a baby. So have a giant, like, animatronic granddad, like, asleep in the chair. The wow. TV reptar or something. Like, yeah. climb up the stairs to get upstairs. I love that. When you first walk in, you're in the playpen thing. Like, that's usually where episodes will start out. Like, they're all, the babies are sitting in a playpen. And then Tommy has to, like, find the screwdriver to escape. And then you can kind of oh, wander yeah. around. Wouldn't that be fun? Like, oh, that's that really be. cool. And I love that the idea of it, of it being baby scale. You know, if you think of a baby being like, I don't know, a third the height of a grown human, that mean instead of a ceiling being 10 feet tall, it'd be like 30 feet tall. Like it would be a huge house. But yeah. it would make you feel like you're really small scale, which is amazing because most of us don't remember being that tall and first like toddling around. But going back to that scale would be fascinating. Like looking up at a refrigerator and you can't even reach like the bottom of the handle. Like... That'd be so weird. <laughs> like, you just gave me another idea to it. I don't know if they have five wits out there, but uh, these, these they're sort of like you go in, there's like different adventures you can do. One of them's a, a Egyptian tomb. One of them's a spaceship adventure. One of them's a castle with a dragon. And cool. you and your friends have to like solve the puzzles to get out of this one room and proceed to the next one. And all this smoke comes out and like we hear this booming voice and it's all part of the theatrical presentation of it. And it's wow. so fun. There could be an aspect to that, like maybe we have to get the screwdriver to get out of here. Now we have to get the dog food out of the fridge in order to get Spike to come in. And then maybe you could like, there could be this part where you actually ride Spike. That'd be and awesome. So- and, and maybe some parts, some parts of the park aren't like designed to be like walk through attractions, but you can only get there riding on Spike's back. But that'd be super fun. Right? <laughs> I love and, that. Uh, oh, maybe even the uh, Reptar thing from the movie in the yeah. basement. I, I love that, and the, the house is so iconic. I think that would be really fun, like, trying to get down the stairs, and the stairs are, you know, like, tall or whatever. Like, yes. that'd be really challenging. <laughs> like, you have to climb these steps like a baby, like, put your shoulder into it and, like, roll over <laughs> to get up to us. And you could you could set it up so that you can kind of use your imagination to find other ways of, of traveling around. Like, maybe there are other toys that can help you, like, you can use as transportation or, like, finding Spike, for example. You can kind of unlock access to new areas or make traveling up the stairs a lot easier because you have spike he can just like kind of carry you up there it's yes. really cool do it your own way you know like you can just do it on foot or you can try to find a vehicle to ride or yeah and if they could make i mean i'm picturing okay so now i'm picturing because i can actually see the layout of the rugrats household yep. in my head <laughs> Unlike simpson's household it actually has consistency to it right right <laughs> I, I just can see it in my head without even trying. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can imagine you coming out of that playpen and then, like I said, going into the kitchen. You got to get the food, dog food out of the fridge. And you could, if they made it so, like, you strap yourself onto Spike or whatever. I mean, I don't know how they do it. It'd have to be a big enough Spike to fit you and a couple friends, maybe. But, yeah. like, make it so that it feels like you're jerking up and down, like you're actually riding right. this bounding dog down the hallway into like the living room where granddad's sleeping. And there's like this giant animatronic snoring granddad. Yeah. I love that. It's such a cool show. And like, I love the way that they use their imagination. Like these babies see things differently than they actually are. So maybe doing, tying that in somehow, you know, like making things appear to be scarier or more exciting, more exciting than they actually are. Like, yeah. um, I don't know if you could use like projectors to make like, the couch seem like it's a monster or whatever you could like actually have an animatronic where things just start to get a little bit scarier a little bit more like a baby might perceive it um but yeah i don't know well, maybe that's that's what they can do like how they do like uh fright nights at universal or whatever where they can actually remodel the household for halloween yes. and, you can, and it's this whole different adventure oh, that's cool that's a good idea if we can uh veer off and 
a couple other shows. I, I had another idea, which that reminds me of. I don't know, maybe that could be tied into this, but oh. um, a haunted house that could sort of take elements from, like, we could have the monsters from Ah Real Monsters popping mm -hmm. up. We yes. can have things from uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark, like Dr. Vink with a v v v <laughs> laboratory or something, and like other, the Ghastly Grinner, or if there's any iconic episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark that people remember. And yeah. That. That's really fun. I, there are a lot of like, kind of, maybe not horror, but like scary, spooky themed stuff that came into Nickelodeon. I think that that is a really fun content area to explore. And Aria Monsters is a really great one because they can, we're pretty much wherever there are sewers, they could pop up. You know, like that's like their travel channel is going yes. through the sewers. So you could do it so that you escape out the front door of, of um, the Pickles household. And like, if you look down into the, like the gutter, they're like some of the Aria Monsters characters can like pop out and say like, hey, you can, you know, come to our like monsters, their, their university thing. It's not Monsters University. Like that's a movie, but like, I forget what oh. it's called. They, yeah, they're... where you actually go into the junkyard and go through yeah. the secret. That would be a really cool place to explore, too. The Grumbles, like, classroom. and It'd be cool if you could access that through just going through the sewers, like, out the front of the Pickles household. Perhaps when you go into the basement and mm -hmm. find Stu's, I don't know what you'd call it, not laboratory, but where he invents things. Yeah, his, like, like workroom. Mm -hmm. His workroom, yeah. Uh, and the Reptar thing is there. Perhaps you could actually ride the Reptar thing out through nice. some, like, exit, and it takes you into the sewers, yeah. and then... At a certain point, you get out and go through the Aria Monsters thing. I, don't know. I love that. Yeah, and there's there's the crawl space that the babies get into in at least one episode because I always remember that part of their house. And maybe you could drive Reptar into that, and then that can get you into the sewer somehow or something like that. Like, I think building transitions into the park other than just like, uh, go back out the door you came in, go back to the hub. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, keeping it immersive and kind of like, uh, yes, anding it. You know what I mean? Like, you've explored the Pickles household, and now you get to do this. Like, you get to kind of stumble your way into the next world yeah and, and maybe you could kind of um broadcast this to the park guests as well like um leave some clues about what they're about to encounter so like you know if their kid is scared of monsters or whatever they don't want to go through the crawl space into the all real monsters area so like maybe there's some kind of sign somewhere that says you know something about that i don't know we'll have to come up with a way or maybe sound effects that start playing like the theme song to all real monsters when you start getting close to it. So you can be like, Oh no, <laughs> let's go back. That can be kind of cool. Yeah. And another thing actually, while we're in the pickles house, um, do you remember the show? Um, it was on Koblam. It was called action league. Now. Action league now. If you go to the upstairs of the pickles household, that's where those, the, uh, um, action <laughs> league now stuff is happening. Like the little character action figures, stop motioning their way through that would be scenes. pretty amazing yeah <laughs> and i don't know how you would do that you know if, if you're a baby scale then action figure scale is it's still like a foot and a half or two feet tall or whatever that could be kind of cool you could have little animatronic characters of all the action figures from that show this isn't what appealed to me about nickelodeon but i mean we can't pretend like it wasn't one aspect of nickelodeon i mean there could even be like if there's an Action League Now ride, which is just sort of like a water ride, which is like a, a giant toilet, and uh, <laughs> it has some type of swirly, like, you know, where you can go in there and, like, you get swept up in the waves. I don't know, but, like, uh, kind of like a wave pool, but more circular motion. Yeah, and that, that um, like, scuba diver character always ended up in a toilet. I think that... <laughs> always, yeah. Stinky yeah. diver. <laughs> there is definitely a, a toilet aspect to the, the Nickelodeon aesthetic, I think. We could embrace that, and that could be a way to get into the sewers as well, you know, come up with the, uh, get into that, like, underground network of getting to the All Real Monsters area. Oh, man. And yeah. do you know, um, Nickelodeon owns um, Ninja Turtles as well. The turtles could be down there, too. Wow, you're you know? right. Yes. And maybe Perfect. the sewer is just, like, you get down there, and it's just, like, flowing with, like, um, with slime. It's not, like, fecal yes. matter. It's not gross. It's, like, this is just the Nickelodeon, like, uh, the veins of Nickelodeon traveling here and there. Um, and then you can get into uh -huh. different areas. Because I, I was originally picturing the, the sewers as being pretty spooky areas, but it doesn't have to be spooky. You know, it can still be no, fun it, and festive. The pipes that bring the slime around. And then yeah. there could be some parts that are a little more sewer-like, where the turtles are, where mm -hmm. the real monsters right. are. 
But then you oh, could also more... get into um, a part maybe like the sewer starts to uh, to dry out and it just becomes like a big pipe and then like it's a skateboarding area for rocket power. Oh, yes. <laughs> we could have like this this interconnected network of of basically all these characters existing within the same town, um, you know, or the same you know at least the close area. You can kind of fudge it a little bit where it's like you go down the sewer and you just walk a little bit and come back up and it pretends like you're in a different town, like in a different state or whatever. So which, which would be fine. You can kind of, it doesn't have to be totally realistic, you know, like where you have to get in your car and drive to the next <laughs> town. It's like, yeah, well it's a theme park. So, you know, use your imagination. And there's so many little aspects that you could do too. Like, I mean, uh, salute your shorts. I would love to see like a camp on Alana somewhere in there that oh, feel like you're fun. at summer camp, do some summer camp activities there. Uh-huh. Uh, wild thornberries. <laughs> Have like some type of animal attractions where you can learn about the animals, do a petting zoo, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and do we want to have, um, you know, wild thornberries took place all over the planet. Do we want to have a part where you can go to, Africa like do you have like a long distance like maybe a plane attraction that can take you there and you can go to like Reptar land Paris and that kind of thing the wild thornberries area actually should be like the different continents of earth and learning about the different animals that live in the different areas and having different ones you can pet in each area and different ones that are you know kept more like a zoo behind bars and all that yeah and in wild thornberries I always loved the vehicle their com v like it's basically like a really heavy duty camper van but it also can, like, deploy flotation devices on all the sides and just becomes, like, a water (laughs) attraction. Because that'd be a really cool, um, like, all-terrain ride vehicle for this theme park, you know? Like, maybe you you meet up with the Wild Thornberries wherever you are, you know, in just the United States, and then you get in their Comvi, and it just, like, hauls all the way to South America really fast, and then, like, you can get out, and you're in South America, and you can, like, explore that or whatever, and then get back in and they deploy the flotation devices and get in the, on the Amazon river. And like, you take that down. That could be really fun. Like as a way of like traveling around the world really quickly, it's like, okay, get back in the com V you're going to see like some kind of uh, motion graphics of like everything flying past you as you drive across the planet really quickly. That could be kind of fun because otherwise it's going to take forever. You know, like traveling around the world is a slow thing (laughs) and we want to do it in a a matter of, you know, an hour or two. Yeah. That's that. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. If we fast travel via the Comvi to Paris, they have Reptar Land. Like, they have a theme park within the Rugrats universe. That's the final stop after the Wild Thornberries adventure. You get yeah. off at Reptar Land, and then you can leave from Reptar Land into, like, some more areas of the theme park, you know, the more theme parky type areas. Reptar Land's got all the Ferris wheels and the roller coasters mm-hmm. or something. Yeah, I like that. And I think being able to transition from one uh kind of world one tv show into a different one smoothly without having to go back and forth is a good way to do it like i don't know if you can fully transition from like okay we're done with the wild thornberries now we're back into some rugrat stuff because otherwise you're gonna be like well you know where are the thornberries like we need to go back to like you don't want to have the the guest feel like they have an itinerary like oh i've got to go back and talk to these people again it's like no you know that adventure is done like you're on the next episode now you can keep going forward Scattered about the park, there obviously has to be food stands, places to get your junk food and everything. Yeah. And I would love it if there were Good Burger stands oh. with uh, everybody's got like the cap with the dreadlock. <laughs> uh, cool. And you could also have, as far as food goes, there were the hot burgers. I don't know if you remember this from Rocket Power, but it was basically a hot dog mixed with a hamburger. Oh, it man. Like, it was a big like food item in that series was the hot burger. I know that cat dog had like a uh, a taco place because they ended up doing a, oh, a tie-in right. with with uh, taco bell like you could get t- cat dog toys at, oh and gur um... gur is obsessed with tacos right <laughs> <laughs> that's true There's... you gotta have powdered toast stands for powdered toast man <laughs> remember powdered toast man yeah They'd be like powdered toast stands <laughs> and uh, the crusty crab yes wow there are so many restaurants i think that food is playing a role in like every single Nickelodeon series. It's just part of the cultural landscape, I guess. We talked about Doug, we talked about Rugrats. What about Ren and Stimpy? (laughs) 
Ren and Stimpy, Doug, and Rugrats were the three original Nicktoons that they led with. If they just had a presence at the park, that's enough. If there's Ren and Stimpy's walking around, you know, stuff yeah. like that. And you could do some kind of gross-out stuff. Like, it, I think that when I was a kid, Nick, uh, Ren and Stimpy really, like, grossed me out just because there was so much, like, like almost body horror of, like, showing up someone's nose and just how nasty it can be. The but, extreme close-ups, yeah. Yeah, but there is a certain... A certain amount of that fits in with. I the... liked Ren and Stimpy, but I also didn't like it because I was always I was never into fart jokes and yeah, the group yeah, me too. Humor. But then again, like there is a big part of of Nickelodeon where it's like, you know, reaching your arm up someone's nose to like pull out a prize during like the live action game shows. It's like that's a little yucky, but it is something that they do pretty consistently on Nickelodeon. So. It's so weird. Like <laughs> crude humor finds its way into like almost everything that I like love. <laughs> Except Jurassic Park and Pokemon. Like, yeah. I absolutely love South Park. I absolutely love Nickelodeon. Mm-hmm. Um, I absolutely love Kevin Smith films. And yet, I don't like crude humor. I, I do sort of feel, you, you could listen to Fairpoint and be like, what do you mean you don't like crude humor? But I, it's weird to me, and I, I've often tried to, like, self-analyze myself. Be like, <laughs> How come if you don't like crude humor, like, three out of the five things you're obsessed with are loaded with crude humor, like Whoa. Nickelodeon, South Park, and Kevin Smith films. Yeah. Why? It's weird. It's really weird. Well, maybe that's something that kind of ties into your overall aesthetic. It's like you like to uh, critique Push things boundary. fairly. Like, okay. I can ignore the parts that are a little crass and focus on the good parts of this. You know, like, I can I can get beyond that. I'm not, I'm not totally disgusted by this, but I just know that I don't like it. So I focus on the other parts, which... I'm a very similar way because I really value Kevin Smith. I really like his podcasts, but there are parts of it that I'm like, man, I'm glad this is in my headphones and not out loud. Cause like some of this, I'm like, that is very oh, questionable. I know. I tried listening to uh, Jay and Silent Bob get old while working a uh, dishwashing job like 10 years ago. And yeah. yeah, I eventually was like, okay, I'm just done trying to listen to your podcasts yeah. at work. Yep, and there there are times when I'm listening to it in the car, and I'm like, I pull up to a red light, and I'm like, I'm going to turn my volume down just in case. <laughs> and it wasn't even like, the bosses were cool. Like, nobody cared that I was listening to it, but eventually I started getting funny looks. Yeah, and it's, it's, <laughs> not really something, <laughs> it's not really something that we want to be associated with, necessarily. It's not that we can't handle it, but it's just like, you know, that's, that's not my vibe, but I do like <laughs> yeah. this work still. Like, I can still accept it for its flaws, or what I consider to be flaws. And, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if people are into it just for the gross-out humor, but I think people like it in spite of that gross-out humor. I'm always intrigued by by the ocean and by swimming pools and, like, just bodies of water in general. It's always something I, like, connect to and am really excited about. So I noticed that there's several different Nickelodeon series have, like, an island associated with them. Like, in uh, Rocco's Modern Life, there's Kerplop It Goes Island. And um, I know that on... Uh, like Hey Arnold, for example, there's there are several different little islands that are nearby that they travel to, and I was thinking it'd be kind of cool to do like an archipelago of of the islands focused or er, featured in these different shows and being able to like travel between them and kind of explore them. I don't know that they were on many episodes. I just know that I always whenever there was an island, I'm like, oh my god, yes. There is always those little aspects of the shows that you personally latch onto and remember, and mm-hmm. to you, they're like a big part of the series, even though they're only in a couple episodes and other people might forget them. Like, I can't think of an example, but I know with Nickelodeon specifically, there's probably a ton of those for me. Right, right. Like, like when you said, when you were talking about the um, the Rugrats swimming pool, I was like, I remember that they went to this, like, big... Um, like public swimming pool and i was really into that episode because it was about swimming and swimming pools like that was just a huge part for me but i think it was only in like one episode you know so did you ever see the the last episode of hey arnold the finale but it kind of leaves off with with arnold having contact with i think both of his parents or maybe just his dad i don't really remember but there was i think that you could kind of leave a trail of breadcrumbs on one of the islands from hey arnold that kind of connects into that plot that never got resolved. And if they're doing a movie, you know, maybe it could tie in with the movie. If there's, yeah. uh, you know, if it, no matter where, like, the action starts in the film, they could have that part of the Hey Arnold portion of the park have that same plot going on where you can kind of get involved in the story of the film. I think that'd be kind of exciting. Trying to find his parents and all that. That would be yeah. great. And there's something about islands, I think, that's always uh, feels more, like, explorable. There's more reason to kind of go into the caves than walking around a city because so many of these series take place in a city you know what i mean where there's like not a ton of like uh 
rural exploration that can happen, but islands tend to lend themselves to that kind of story. Another show that I really value from Nickelodeon that has to do a little bit with water again is uh, The Angry Beavers. Did you watch that show? Oh, yes! I love it! This show I was so into. I think I think it might be a little bit too um, hyperactive for me as an adult to really enjoy. But when I was a kid, I was all about this. I loved the aesthetic of their house and like all the crazy stuff that happened inside of it. And um, I think just having like a, a big replica of their house that you can walk through and explore would be really fun. It was a, a very strangely designed house with like spiral staircases and all the walls were curved and there's all kinds of weird stuff. Cat dog. Cat dog. Alone in the world with a little cat dog. Cat dog's house was really, really cool. It's like half bone and half fish. There's just a really cool looking house on that show. But that's something that we could add in as well. Just kind of some of these cool iconic houses. Um, and actually, speaking of iconic houses, we didn't really talk about this yet. But hey, Arnold. Hey, Arnold. His bedroom oh. is so cool <laughs> it is and just even just his i mean his block like i had mentioned earlier because the whole show kind of does take place on this block aside from when they're at school maybe mm-hmm. uh because his neighborhood is under a um highway but like it was built with the idea that like his neighborhood could get like torn away for like development at any point and like he was just sort of like this forgotten little corner of New York City and like I I love that I would love to go visit Hey Arnold to see his awesome room in the attic and walk through the apartment building and totally it's kind of like um the Dumbo neighborhood of New York like just underneath the Manhattan Bridge like that's really cool to be under a bridge where you're you're in the shadows you know what I mean like it's almost like things can kind of thrive on their own there because it's not as commercial like people don't want to buy fancy high-rise apartments right there necessarily and there was the local grocery store too. Yeah, it's it's much more like a, a small town feel within a big city. Wow, you know I mean? yeah. they could even have like at the little alley, you could like go play baseball or something. Maybe they could have little like athletic events you could do there. And I stuff. love that because they have that just kind of flexible space. Like there's an uninhabited section of a block. I love that. Just using that for whatever events you want to have. You know, you could have like um, like a, a kind of carnival area could stop there. Like things could change there. It's a very flexible space, or it could just be, you know, the local ball field, like where people play kickball and baseball and stuff. And again, remaking this whole park for Halloween would be awesome. Go trick or treating in Arnold's neighborhood, get some oh, candy. That's you know? a great like, idea. And you could have all the um, the characters. Like you could have employees dressed up as all the various like famous characters from that show. Yeah, I'd love that. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Um. Cool. Are there other shows that are popping to mind right now for for you that you want to cover? All the game shows, Legends of the Hidden Temple, Nick Arcade, Double Dare, Guts, you know, the Aggro Crag. <laughs> I don't I feel like going into detail on these would be it's just what it is on the show. Just right. At, let, just people do can that. come watch, people can participate. Yeah, mm-hmm. just do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Invader Zim. Like, Mm -hmm. I love Invader Zim, and I actually have the other really cool idea I had was uh, I would love to see a VR adventure, a VR mixed with real life adventure like we talked about a lot in the Batman episode. Yep. Where you've got Dib on your, like, watches or your screens or whatever, like, popping up in your little, like, Iron Man windows, you know, on your Your visor. Your heads-up display, yeah. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. Dib is sort of guiding you through this, like, siege on Zim's household. So you've got to, like, because his house was really iconic, too. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And maybe you bust in and Gurr's sitting there watching TV. I don't know, but, like, an adventure <laughs> that's almost like a laser tag. You're that's not awesome. shooting your – you're all on a team, mm-hmm. but with your VR helmets, like, maybe the robot guards come out and try to attack, and you've got to, like, shoot them. And it eventually culminates with Zim in this big robot, you know, like – thing like attacking you and you've got to like all like shoot at zim aim for the weak points of the suit and like you know just like a video game but you're yeah. in it dibs like the guy awesome. was like 
barking like make sure you aim at the elbows or something and i love that and it'd be really cool doing this as a multiplayer thing in a house that's got multiple stories so you know you can be on the first floor window but then you know once once enemies start getting closer and closer maybe you have to like board up the windows and move up to the second story and like keep shooting well, you'd from be the going second story. down oh i see what Zim's house did right. was it ship, but then well, it, then it like drilled down like Into miles the, the yeah. surface, to make right. his base. That's yeah. really cool. So you can kind of give up, like you know, they've already breached the front door. We need to move into the basement, starting to move into more secure areas. So it's almost like a zombie survival kind of thing, but in the Invader Zim universe. Dib sending you in there to capture Zim, or like to get proof about Zim, or to get maybe not Zim, but some piece of Urkin technology or something, and like that's cool. yeah. And then, Zim catches you, you gotta fight him. Yeah, I think that would be so much fun. And or it could it's... be that the other invaders are like, you know, getting tired of Zim, like disgracing their, you know, their race and they're coming after him. And then, like... that happens while you're doing your siege. And oh, Zim's that's... like, abort, abort. But then you can't abort because they've got it, you know, that's locked cool. in. Yeah, that would be great. I like it. And then maybe you have to join forces with Zim. Like maybe at the beginning, <gasps> you could either be on Zim's team, like trying to take the the house or on Dib's team, which, whichever one. And then you eventually have to, everyone has to join forces inside the house and try to fight the invaders. Or I'm picturing, yeah, I'm picturing you get down to the lower levels. And like when Zim, when you finally are fighting like Zim in boss mode, Dib's like, Zim, don't you get it? Like the other Urkin invaders are here. They're coming to kill you. And he's like, you think I'm going to fall for that human? <laughs> and, like, so you still got to fight Zim. Nice. While you've got to like beat him before the Urkin invaders get there or something. Oh, and they show up and then you, I don't know, team up or something. That sounds and, really cool. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Like maybe you, so it's, it's kind of like you're being pushed down into the basement by the invaders. And like you're trying to push Zim further down. And eventually you get Zim, and then you're like, okay, well, now we just have to turn around and try to fight our way back out. That could be really fun. That could be like a long uh, engagement. There could be a lot of story elements that unfold during this. That could be fun. And people love Gur, and you could easily keep Gur around. Like, when you enter the house, he's on the couch, and he's like, ooh, I'm going to come with you guys. <laughs> yeah. I just care. Like, I think, he's a horrible I, guard. So. In between the waves of enemies coming, you could definitely have some comic relief elements or, like, time to kind of explore the house and, like, look at the little details and stuff. Or maybe there are... Um, like puzzles like zim's got like security in place where you need to figure out a way of getting through this locked door that kind of thing yeah hmm. or Gur's just like i'm gonna lock this door now like, why are you doing that it's like you gotta solve the puzzle that's great <laughs> yeah he's so great pure chaos with this with Gur. it's so fun i love that guy yeah that's awesome uh that sounds like a super fun way to bring invader zim and that whole world into this into this universe Wow. I'd love it. Dude, this is really fun. Um, and we've hardly touched on SpongeBob. I know that's a huge one for a lot of people. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? SpongeBob SquarePants! and yellow and porous is he? SpongeBob SquarePants! If not a nonsense, be something you I mean, you could actually do an underwater area. Like, maybe have it based on, um, on Sandy's like little dome under there because it's got oxygen in it you know the humans can survive there but then you can you know put your face against the glass and look out and see the whole bikini bottom existing with you know either animatronics or just like screens well, and projections to make it look like people are actually living out there or, or yeah that totally and if we've got an unlimited budget like let's get let's get an aquarium in there let's get some sharks and some That'd whales awesome. some dolphins swimming around and i mean unlimited budget you might as well give everyone a sandy style like scuba suit where you can just walk around bikini bottom and it's actually oh filled God. with water wouldn't that be crazy that would be amazing yeah that'd be nuts well, that'd be really fun <laughs> the spongebob world is really cool and i've always wanted to ride one of their bicycles that just has like um like paddles like a an old like paddle boat you just get to ride a bicycle made of that? That'd be so fun. Uh, it really would be, yeah. <laughs> I love that that whole world. And um, the SpongeBob movie I just watched recently, like the, the original SpongeBob movie, where there's a scene where they're riding on the back of David Hasselhoff. He's just like flying like a speedboat on the top of the water. And they're having like a fight scene on top of him. I want them to just build a gigantic, like 40 foot long David Hasselhoff speedboat. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll sign off on it. Uh, yeah, that's a good place to end, I think. So, uh, yeah. Well, this sounds like a fun park. I would definitely want to check this out and, and kind of appreciate and dive into the history of Nickelodeon. And we didn't even get into the stuff from the past 17 years of Nickelodeon. You know, we just oh, got we into the beginning. we easily do a part two, a part three. We didn't talk about my girl, Alex Mack. We didn't talk about my girl, Clarissa. There's, there's so much to talk about. That's um, true. 
Cool. Well, yeah, thank you listeners for uh, for following along in this journey. And if you got anything else you want to add, feel free to find us on social media at Amusement Sparks. And um, yeah, you guys should check out Nathan Kay's other work if you haven't yet. Uh, please, please do. Please do. Thank you. I'd appreciate it. We're on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, everywhere. Just look for Silph Radio, S-I-L-P-H, or Fair Point Podcast, or Fair Enough Podcast. Or, or go to secretroommultimedia.com. You can yeah, find it all there. The We've home actually of got it new all. comics up there. There's new music coming soon. So lots of cool stuff there, too. It is for <laughs> adults, though. I love your guys' ambition that you, you bring on all these additional projects because I always come up with new projects and I'm like, uh, I'm going to put this on Google Drive and maybe I'll come back to it in 10 years. <laughs> like, oh, well, to be fair, I mean, I'm 32 years old and that's my life is coming up. <laughs> that, I've never finished anything. And Fairpoint is what, I mean, I think that's what's forcing me to really actually become a writer because me and Craig had a deadline. We had to finish our 100th episode mm-hmm. and we had to write it. So like at moments when we're like, I don't know what to do, it was sort of like, oh, well, we're at work. Do, do something, it. yeah. Oh, that's that great. That forced us to come up with something good and realize, like, oh, if we force ourselves to do it, sometimes we're getting hung up on little things that don't matter as much as we think they do, and then we finish our projects. Mm-hmm.